But today we continue. This is number two in a series this fall that we've called, We Came to America to Perform. And we will be talking to four great artists of the circus who left, uh, who left their homes abroad to come to America to perform uh, with the greatest show on earth. And in doing so, uh, greatly enriched not only that show, but um, our nation and most significantly, I believe, in today's case, our, our city. Um, our guest today is also a very good friend, Pedro Reyes. He was born and trained in South Africa. He quickly uh, turned professional and toured throughout Europe before coming to the United States, um, where he achieved great success. Um, I like to think that he had two life-altering falls. Uh, the first was the fall from a high wire, which changed his life and the tra trajectory of his career. And the second time was when he fell in love um, <laughs> with um, the wonderful Dolly Jacobs. Uh, and I think by extension fell in love with this city and the legacy of the circus. So we're gonna talk about all of that and more, but for right now, join me in welcoming Pedro Reyes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to begin in South Africa because I don't know about everyone else here, but I don't think Americans have uh, a, a firm grasp of the history of South Africa or the makeup of that nation. So tell us a little bit about where you came from and what it was like when you were there, if you would. Sure. Well, South Africa was, uh, or still is, uh, at that time, a bilingual country. We had to learn to speak English and Afrikaans because of the Dutch influence. Um, and at that time, there was apartheid, like similar to America with segregation. So I grew up with that. Um, and, you know, coming to America, it was, uh, I noticed a lot of similarities with South Africa. Um, and your family's history in South Africa, what brought them to that nation? And um, my mom's family were Dutch descent, and my father was from Madeira, Portugal. So hence the name Pedro, race, no hablo espanol. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, an only child, siblings? No, I had uh, a brother, Gabriel, and three sisters. There were five of us. Five and of I'm them. the only one that ended up joining the, or joining the circus, or should I say, running away and joining the circus. <laughs> well, what I'm trying to get to here without just asking it, but I guess I'm going to just ask it. You ended up doing one of the most dangerous acts in the history of circus. So you're, you're a daredevil, right? You could say that. So I'm trying to get, you started circus training at the age of 12. I gotta get a handle on who was Pedro at the age 12. Were you a daredevil? Well, in South Africa, we, we, we were outdoors all the time, you know, very much like children uh, those days. We only got television in 1979 so we weren't huddled indoors. There were no cell phones, computers. We were outdoors. And my parents had moved from one suburb to another, Kenilworth to observatory. And when I woke up the next day, I opened the front door, looked outside, and lo and behold, at the YMCA was a flying trapeze rigging. And so as a little boy, I would wander across the street, creep through the fence, jump on the trampolines, and jump in the flying trapeze nets, get chased by the warden of the YMCA around and around the trampoline, gone, gone into lots of trouble, but eventually befriended those that were training to become trapeze artists to go to Europe and actually you know, become professional. And so I was then invited to go on the flying trapeze, and uh, honestly, I, I'd been watching for so long that I kind of took to it naturally. And so from the flying trapeze school at the YMCA, it developed into a circus of youth. And more of my, I used to bring more and more of my school friends to come and join. And so more and more kids from the streets, from the neighborhood, started coming around to the YMCA. And it really became about very, very similar to Sailor Circus. We had about 80 students. And so that's how I started my training. And after a few years, uh, we decided that we wanted to take the circus world by storm, turn professional, and go to Europe. So, so what would have been the career path had you not discovered the circus apparatus? Uh, well, uh, I played piano. Um, I wanted to be a musician. My mom, the warden at the one said, wanted to become a lawyer or doctor, of course. <laughs> and the true story is that in my final year at school, um, in my matriculation year, 
three months into that final year, I took my books, went to the principal's office and said, I won't be needing these books anymore because I'm going to join the circus. <laughs> True story. <laughs> but while you were at the, the YMCA, you actually helped form when you were still sure. a teenager, right? Yeah, so it was primarily a flying trapeze school. We had a trampoline and flying trapeze. A trampoline because you learned how to do somersaults, you learned body control, and then flying trapeze. And then, as I said, when I started flying on the flying trapeze, I invited more and more of my schoolmates to come and fly on a trampoline or bounce on a trampoline. And um, Keith Anderson was running the school at that time. And a friend of mine who became my mentor, who lived in Sarasota, Florida, George Shamberdi from Algiers, used to come to uh, South Africa to visit Boswell and Wilkie Circus. His wife's sister married Mr. Wilkie. And so George Shamberdi once a year would come to Cape Town, South Africa, and bring swivels, uh, Spanish webs, to Boswell and Wilkie Circus. And so we got to meet George, and we said to George, would you like to come and teach at our circus school? And he became my mentor, taught me a lot about uh, circus arts in general, circus disciplines, about doing it the right way. And, um, you know, he put the stories about Sarasota in my head at that time. <laughs> and he, was, he traveled on the greatest show on earth. And so it became my dream to one day go to America, go to Sarasota, and join the greatest show on earth. Wow. So the circus you mentioned, the name of it again was, was the big South African circus? Boswell and Wilkie Circus, yeah. And a one ring circus? A one ring circus, one yeah. ring European style circus. Correct. And had you gone to the circus before you started trapeze? I remember the first time I ever went to the circus. I went to St. Agnes Catholic School, and I remember this little man, dwarf, midget, whatever you want to call him, I'm not politically correct, <laughs> uh, came to the school and was handing out his vouchers, 50 cents discount vouchers. And so we all got excited. Uh, the teacher asked this classroom, Would you like to go to the circus? So we said, all said yes. We chartered a bus, and we all went off to Cape Town, for sure, and went to see Boswell Wilkie Circus. While I can remember getting out the bus, walking towards the circus tent, and hearing the lion roar in the background, in the back of the tent, and just being awe as I walked up the stairs, and there was a smell. In South Africa, the ring was off the ground, and it was this giant wooden stage or floor, and they used coir mat, coir hair, coconut hair, and of course, it had a certain smell to it from the animals and the performances. And I saw the candy butchers walking up and down, cotton, candy, popcorn. And it was just an, inc an incredible experience. It was just amazing. But to jump way forward to today, for example, it's, I'm just going to bridge a whole gap here. Okay. I saw kids perform. The family was called the Anastasinis when I was 10, 11 years old. That family ended up working for Circus Sarasota later in the years. It's an amazing, small world, you know. Um, so you, you, you bring your friends. The first group uh, that I had, saw record of, and again, I got I to gotta thank um, Mr. Ingracia for his research, um, the Star Lords. Correct. Tell us about the Star Lords. The Star Lords were, there were 13 of us in the troupe. We did a triple wide flying trapeze act like the Ward Bells did, three catches. We did seven different acts, high wire included, teeterboard, bicycle, trampoline, comedy. And uh, we went to Europe for the very first time, went to Denmark, worked at a couple of the Tivoli's, went to England, knew nothing about the circus, but knew everything about the circus because we were young. <laughs> and uh, it was an incredible adventure. We learned how to put up tents how to put up the riggings, how to take them down, how to move. In Europe, there were a lot of one-day uh, uh, stands. And uh, it was, went to Holland, went to Sicily, went to Norway, worked at Monte Carlo twice. Were you a senior member of the, this 13? I mean, who kept this organized? Who kept these 13 people? I did. You did? Actually, the 13th person was Keith Anderson. But he left me in charge, and I ran the show. I, well, I was in charge of everybody. I made show, sure everybody got up at time, showed up in time, was you know, in costume at time. I basically led the team. So you acted as, as, as manager, director, agent? I mean, did you get no the No agent, no. Yeah? No agent. It was really, I mean, we were young and very adventurous. And again, there was, wasn't much in South Africa. So to be able to go to Europe as trapeze artists, wow. 
<laughs> you know, wet tights, <laughs> meet lots of girls. <laughs> it was a great adventure. <laughs> I mean, you, you went to the circus, you saw flying trapeze artists flying through the air. It was incredible, you know, and then having the chance to actually become a fly, flying trapeze artist, it was huge. So would you, would you have characterized yourself as a natural born risk taker or would you say that that, what came first? No, adventure. adventure. I would say adventure, not risk taker, just adventure and a set of ethics at wanting to be the best if ever I tried something. So um, having the troop was a challenge. The troop lasted together for four years and during those four years of traveling through Europe, we did some changes, you know. For example, Dr. John Storr. So we had a doctor who had been studying, had, had uh, qualified as a doctor, he's got his diploma and everything. He was in the troop? But it became a catcher in the flying trapeze, came to Europe with us, traveled with us for three years, and then left to go back to being a doctor. <laughs> he is now a professor at the Royal Academy of Physicians in London. Have you kept track uh, or are in touch with uh, some of these guys? Well, Facebook, we keep in touch. Yeah, yeah. it's great. <laughs> Any chance of a, a reunion of the Star Lords here in Sarasota? Uh, no. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the, the Star Lords and then the next group, um, a smaller group, four people, right? Right. Became the survivors. The survivors. The survivors um, became an a, a act because... After four years, we had gone back to South Africa, Boswell Wilkie Circus, and toured, and we all agreed we'd shake hands and we'd part and go our own ways. I still wanted to do circus. I could do flying trapeze, but I realized earlier on that I was a mediocre flying trapeze artist. I could do a triple somersault, but I couldn't point my feet. And how can you become a trapeze artist without pointing your feet? I mean, it just... <laughs> point your feet. You know? <laughs> so... Um, it came about that a friend of mine, I kept asking questions, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? And a friend of mine said, hey, I've got this video of this act, come and have a look at this video. I took one look at this video and that was it. It was a video of the Palacis. The Palacis were a husband and wife team. They did what is called a cradle act or a casting act. The video was shot in uh, Bouglion Cirque de Verre and uh, they used a big net safety net. The husband would hang by his legs in the cradle and the wife would leap out from the frame, the cradle frame, and he would catch her. Explain the cradle frame for those well, of us who it's, don't. It's two bars, if you will, joined in an oval or square. The catcher hangs by his legs and uses his legs to push off and his body becomes the pendulum, the, the trapeze. His wife would then jump out into the air. He would extend himself out, catch, and they would then do somersaults, pirouettes, and different tricks. But like I said, with a big safety net. The truth is, I found out that the original act, or one of many of the originals, was the Clarence. And this was a French act. And the Clarence did the same tricks, somersaults, flicks, flacks, without a net, without safety devices whatsoever. And they had actually worked in South Africa on Bos and Wilkie Circus many years ago. And during that time, the partner had fallen and got killed. And then I found out there was another partner, and he also fell and got killed. And so the acts stopped, and there were no more of these acts. No more of these acts meant it was an open market. <laughs> right? The opportunity to fall and get killed was there. No. <laughs> Fame and fortune. That's the way I saw it. So that's when we started uh, practicing. We were still with Bos and Wilkie Circus, finishing off the final year. And we would practice at least three times a day, uh, perfecting the, the cradle act. And then the following year, we signed up with Bos and Wilkie Circus. We were doing a flying trapeze act, the cradle act called the survivors, and one other aerial act. But without a net. No safety devices whatsoever. Whose decision is, I mean, I mean, I can see you coming forward and say, I'm seeking fame and fortune. I'm going to do this without a net. But what, what say does the circus owner have in this, Any? Well, the more dangerous, the better, because he's going to sell more tickets. Okay. So, <laughs> so, the, so that was 1983, I beg your pardon, 1982. And when the season was ending, we decided we wanted to go to Europe. At that time, of course, we still had the VHS videos, and I sent out bunches of these videos to different circuses in Europe. 
and could not get a reply from any of the directors. On the show was a clown act called the Cheekies, and they were from Switzerland, and they said, I'll help you, we'll help you, and they called Circus Knock uh, in Switzerland and told the director about the South African act, the survivors, and so we got a contract to go to Switzerland at a much lesser fee than we would have dreamed of taking, but it was our jump, a, a stepping stone to Europe to be seen and to be discovered. So that was in 1983, we went to Europe. What was your family's response to all of this? What started out with, you know, little Pedro going across the street to play on the trampoline, and now you're doing this. Any, sure. any well, resistance? My father died very early, and uh, I was raised then by my mother. Uh, she was very supportive of the idea of me becoming a, a circus artist, a trapeze artist. Um, yeah, I didn't have much opposition at all. Uh, there was not much interest of support because she didn't know anything about the circus. Yeah. But I, you know, there, you know there, there was enough of us young, adventurous. Did she come see the shows? Uh, no. So she didn't see you doing this. I do not recall her ever coming to see the show. In fact, you know, now that you say that, when we came back to finish our tour with the Star Lords in South Africa, she came to see a show. Wow. Yeah. So we go, from, we go from the Star Lords to the Survivors to you going solo. What led to the solo act? So the Survivors Act, like, like I said, it, so we were in Switzerland, 1983, with Circus Knock touring. And uh, the, one day the director, very excited, came knocking on our caravan door, our RV door, and said, oh, uh, Ringling are here, Ringling are here. Very excited, Ringling, who's, yeah, yeah. So it <laughs> turns out that Irvin Felt and Kenneth Felt had come to Switzerland, gone to Circus Knee, and were scouting for their a new show, The Blue Unit, to go out on the road in 1984. As I mentioned earlier on, it was always my dream to come to America and join Ringling. So they came to the show, saw our act, and came to our trailer after the show, and we negotiated, and they signed us up the very next day to come and tour for 1984 and 85 with uh, The Greatest Show on Earth. So I wrote a postcard to my mentor, George Shamberti, in Sarasota and said, we're coming to Sarasota. Wow. So what was very exciting. Um, you already shared this with me when we were talking earlier, but you're, I, I love your first impression of Sarasota and the circus. Do you remember what you told me? Well, we were, after a long flight, uh, Bill, I'll, you'll get, uh, Bill picked us up okay. <laughs> uh, in a van, no seats in the back, um, and we were starving. So we went to McDonald's. It was great. <laughs> and we went from Tampa Airport to uh, Venice. Um, and then we went onto the train, and my impression of the train was very different to what I had envisioned in my head of this luxurious train <laughs> with plush velvet carpet. Uh, it, was a, it was just a train <laughs> with bunks and uh, uh, small um, you know, rooms. Um, and, you know, we had been on the flight for a long time. I, yeah, I turned on the light. But, and, but your expectations of, of Sarasota and the, well, and the world of circus being everywhere? Well, later on, I mean, you know, so that was the first night, and we got settled a couple of days later. Then we came, and I went to go see my, my mentor, George and Birdie. And in fact, we got to see the first show folk show in Robots Arena. And I was looking around, looking for the trapeze artists, looking for the tents, looking for the circuses, because I'd envisioned that there were these circuses all over Sarasota. <laughs> this was the circus capital of the world. <laughs> So it was, it was strange, it was interesting, you know. So you, you get on the Ringling Show with the, the Survivors, Survivors, right? correct. And um, in how many seasons were, were you on the... Well, two years. And during the two years, it was the, in 1985, it was four years that we had stayed together as a, as a, as a troop, as an act. And during that time, my catcher, Stanley Bauer, who was an incredible catcher, incredible, um, who we, you know, we just trusted each other implicitly. We just knew each other's bodies, the moves, the timings. Uh, he got more and more nervous. Another story is when we got to um, Sarasota, we got to meet Charlie Bauman, who was the performance director, and his wife was Araceli Bauman. 
And they had a home here. Araceli's parents had a home in Sarasota, and I got to meet her parents. And the father, Kiriki, was nicknamed Kiriki, lo, lo and behold, did the same act as we did, the survivors, in America. And the last time that type of act had been seen in America was 1952. And here's where a parallel comes in. He told me a story about how his act ended. They were in Madison Square Garden, working without a net, safety devices, and he was about to do a front somersault, and his catcher froze and didn't let him go. The catcher had lost his nerve, basically, and had fear for the flyer's life. And he just couldn't do it anymore, imagining the jumper leaping out and him missing him. And so he lived with that in his subconscious for many, many years, and eventually it got the better of him. And the same thing was happening to my catcher. And he used to come to me and tell me, he said, I'm really nervous. I'm getting more and more nervous. I really don't want to do this anymore. So we decided in 1985, say, let's go to Europe. Let's do some uh, galas. Let's do the Carré Theatre in uh, Amsterdam. Let's choose some very prestigious show. We did Monte Carlo. And then we ended up, the act ended in Circus Krohn, where we did our one month in Krohn, and we shook hands, and we parted ways. And that's a true story. So the parallel of Kiriki's act in 1952 and our act in 1985 mm. ended pretty much the same. Um, other people that we've, we've talked to, other people I've talked to, on the, uh, talked about the difference from going from the one ring circus tradition to coming to the Ringling Show and performing and w with the three rings and the stages. What was your response on that? Was it? It's, it's a huge difference. You know, in the one ring European style circus, you're very intimate, like in this theater. The audience are very close, you, you, you know, 20 feet away at the most. And in the arenas, in Madison Square Garden, I think they seated must be 27 to 30,000 people with three rings. And it was just completely different uh, atmosphere. And in, you know, in America, the three ring circus is a, a lot to do with concessions. So we would be doing a front somersault and right here down in the seats, I'd hear snow cones, snow cones. <laughs> <laughs> but something I guess you just had to get used to it, you know, it yeah. was a different uh, energy. It's a different, yeah, it most. So you go to, um, you come back with the solo act, right? You come back to? So after the survivors, um, I, I, I again struggled with what I was gonna do in the circus world. What could I do was different? What could I do that would set me apart? And so I decided to do a cloud swing act. And again, I didn't want to do just an ordinary cloud swing act because there were other cloud swings on the market. Tell those of us who don't know what a cloud swing act. A cloud swing I created was 35 foot long rope made out of uh, cotton covered by a canvas, attached at two points, and it became a swing. And then what you would do is build up the swing and then do various falls catch by one leg, catch by one arm under your armpits, and basically become a daredevil um, in the air and, you know, a, a thrill act. Uh -huh. So I thought about, okay, how am I going to be a different clouting act? So I envisioned a giant hoop suspended in the air about 25 feet away that could burst into flame, and I would then do a front somersault through the hoop and catch a rope on the other side. So, that was a thought. <laughs> it starts with a thought. Then the practical side sets in and you realize it's very difficult to do a somersault of a rope. There's nothing to push off. So then I thought, okay, I know this woman, Dolly Jacobs, who does a somersault to the rope. So let me think, if I do a jump to the rope, what if? What if the rope was pulled up and set on a piece of string, and what if I grabbed the rope and I fell about 25 feet with this rope and I had bungee at the other end of the cable so I could be in the ground in two seconds? That was a good thought. <laughs> so then I decided to make it a reality. I ma made my own cloud swing. I had a Bulgarian friend, Ashley, Atli, sorry who taught me how to make my own cloud swing. He taught me how to cover it with canvas. At that time, we were invited to come back to Ringling with a few other acts that we were training in South Africa, and I practiced this cloud swing act. So doing the cloud swing act, the tricks weren't too bad. I was a daredevil anyway. But then comes a time when you have to do the jump. 
So I put on a safety belt. The rope was suspended 26 feet away from the original rope. And I jumped with the safety belt on. And then came the time when he had to take the safety belt off. And it's just a concrete floor. So this is where we as trapeze artists, as professionals, we are very good self-psychologists. We can convince ourselves to do these very dangerous and stupid things, you know? <laughs> and all for a paycheck. <laughs> so, but to be different and to be the best and to be unique is what it really is all about. So I practiced the act, I did the jump, and then I had to work out the span of the bungee, the density of the bungee, I knew nothing about, I'm not a physics teacher, professor, <coughs> it was all a guesswork, and I'm here to tell you that I guessed pretty well. But unfortunately, on the Big Apple Circus, I had an unfortunate accident where I couldn't set my own rigging. Uh, Katja Schumann had a horse act, a liberty act before me, and they had to set my rope after I was actually up in the air on the Cloud Swing Act. So this particular performance on the Big Apple Circus in uh, Connecticut, I was in um, Brewster. Um, Paul Binder, the ringmaster, the founder of the Big Apple Circus, came into the ring. He even shook the rope. The rope was set. And I got ready to do the jump. Drum roll, please. Built up the swing. Jumped. Grabbed the rope as normal. Perfect jump. Felt the string break. And then I was on the floor, and I realized that I was in lots of pain. And I realized that both my ankles were broken. And then I looked up from lying on the floor, and I saw the end of the cable with the shackle dangling. And I realized they had moved the cable over, tied the piece of string that was the breakaway string, and forgot to attach the bungee. So when I grabbed the rope, the string broke, and then it was just nothing to stop me. So they said that that was the end of my career as an aerialist. No. Um, I uh, healed, I went to the gym, I got better, and um, Dolly Jacobs actually got an offer from Jimmy Hammond to do a tour. So you knew Dolly at this time? I met Dolly in 1984. In 1984, the blue unit was rehearsing in Venice, okay. and the red unit was in Lakeland, I believe, on a two-week uh, uh, you know, time out. I got to meet her the first time in Sarasota. We briefly spoke. I knew who she was, a, a, you know, a, a superstar aerialist. Um, and I said to my friend Mark uh, Pilger, I said, can you introduce me to Dolly Jacobs? Sure. Hi, I'm Pedro Reyes. Hi, I'm Dolly Jacobs. And then, later on, um, I left the Ringling Show, and I started to practice at the Sailor Circus. Well, lo and behold, Dolly was off the road, and Dolly was training at the Sailor Circus. And that's where we met again and the rest is history, you know? <laughs> wow. Um, um, I interrupted you, you because you kind of jumped ahead to I healed. Sure, um, well... But there's got... I mean, it wasn't like one day your ankles were broken and the next day you were healed. No, actually, I had 18 screws and two plates in my left ankle, uh, which they removed, and then I had a subtalar joint fusion in my right ankle. Um, and Dolly got this offer to tour with Hammond and the tour was going to be the um, anniversary of the seven-man pyramid uh, accident in Detroit in the same building. And it was, you know, a, they were going to recreate the seven-man pyramid at the, at the same place, at the same building. And so Jimmy Hammond offered uh, Dolly the tour. Uh, her sister and brother-in-law were invited with the elephants. And I said to Jimmy at that time, I said, Jimmy, would you like to book my cloud swing act? It had been about a year after my accident. And he said, oh, I didn't know you were doing the cloud swing. Well, I wasn't. But I said, yeah, I'm doing it again. He said, sure, I will book your cloud swing act. So I uh, you know, committed myself to training again at Sailor Circus. And the reason why I did it was I just needed to, as they say, have closure. I had fallen because of a, mis a malfunction, not a mal mal set rigging. And I hadn't missed the rope. I hadn't made a mistake. And there's a thing in you that makes you want to do it again. So I practiced at Sailor Circus with my subtailor joint fusion. Um, took me a few weeks, and I was doing the jump again. Went on the road, did a, a tour. And after that tour, honestly, I, it was like, you know what? I'm done. 
I was very satisfied to roll up the cloud swing, put it in a bag, and say, I have closure. So how long was it between the fall, the accident, and, and when you did it again? About a year, I'd say at least a year, and Dolly can correct me on that, but it might have been a little bit longer, but definitely a year, at least a year. And you trained in the same... Sailor Circus. Sail where you are now. Yeah, Sailor wow. Circus. Yeah. You know, you say there's something in you. <clears throat> there's not, there's, that's not in me. I mean, um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, I'm sitting here, and I always think, you know, uh, my life, maybe others of you feel this way, you know, like the scariest thing I had to decide was like what to put on my resume and what to leave off. Um, you know, but uh, recreating this, the, the pyramid, recreating this act, um, you know, in one case people, lives were lost, in the other case your, your legs were, were crushed, I mean, but you just got to do it again, huh? Yeah, I think, um, you know, sometimes they say the bug gets you, well, the bug got me. And once the bug gets you, you bug. Yeah. Simple as that. And then after the accident, after I you know, gave up the um, Cloud Swing Act, Dolly and I had always wanted to work together. But she was a headliner and I was a headliner with the Cloud Swing Act. And so circuses never booked two headliners. They booked you know, a headliner. Uh, but the accident gave us the opportunity to create what we called On Wings of Love. It was an aerial pas de deux on the aerial straps, and I had seen a strap act on Cirque du Soleil, uh, this uh, Russian fellow was doing, and I, I thought it was just amazing. Uh, you had the sense of flight, and it was so smooth. And the idea was, what if we created a pas de deux? And so we hired jo um, Guy Caron, who was the original artistic director for Cirque du Soleil. We brought in a choreographer, Jean Leger, who was the artistic director for the Winnipeg Royal Ballet, and we created this pas de deux. Um, and our first show was at Bush Gardens in, in, Sarasota, in Florida, Tampa, and we got an opportunity to go to Montreal. From Montreal, we got an opportunity to go to Japan, and from Japan, we went to Stuttgart. And during that time as working as a part of the, we soon realized uh, working together might not... I interrupted you, you're on... Because you kind of jumped ahead to I healed. Sure. Um, well, but there's got, I mean, it wasn't like one day your ankles were broken and the next day you were healed. No, actually, I had 18 screws and two plates in my left ankle, uh, which they removed. And then I had a subtalar joint fusion in my right ankle. Um, and Dolly got this offer to tour with Hammond. And the tour was going to be the um, anniversary of the Seven Man Pyramid uh, accident in Detroit in the same building. And it was, you know, a, they were going to recreate the seminary pyramid at the, at the same place, at the same building. And so Jimmy Hammett offered uh, Dolly the tour. Uh, her sister and brother-in-law were invited with the elephants. And I said to Jimmy at that time, I said, Jimmy, would you like to book my cloud swing act? It'd been about a year after my accident. And he said, oh, I didn't know you were doing the cloud swing. Well, I wasn't. But I said, yeah, I'm doing it again. He said, sure, I will book your cloud swing act. So... I, uh, you know, committed myself to training again at Sailor Circus. And the reason why I did it was I just needed to, as they say, have closure. I had fallen because of a mis a malfunction, not a mal mal set rigging. And I hadn't missed the rope. I hadn't made a mistake. And there's a thing in you that makes you want to do it again. So I practiced at Sailor Circus with my sub joint fusion. Um, took me a few weeks, and I was doing the jump again. Went on the road, did a, a tour, and after that tour, honestly, I, it was like, you know what, I'm done. I was very satisfied to roll up the cloud swing, put it in a bag, and say, I have closure. So how long was it between the fall, the accident, and, and when you did it again? About a year, I'd say at least a year. And Dolly can correct me on that, but it might have been a little bit longer, but definitely a year, at least a year. And you trained in the same... Sailor Circus. Sail where you are now. Yeah, Sailor wow. Circus. Yeah. You know, you say there's something in you. <clears throat> there's not, there's, that's not in me. I mean, um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, I'm sitting here, and I always think, you know, uh, my life, maybe others of you feel this way, you know, like the scariest thing I had to decide was like what to put on my resume and what to leave off. Um, you know, but uh, recreating this, the, the pyramid, recreating this act, um, you know, in one case people, 
lives were lost. In the other case, your, your legs were, were crushed. I mean, but you just got to do it again, huh? Yeah, I think, um, you know, sometimes they say the bug gets you. Well, the bug got me. And once the bug gets you, you bug. Yeah. Simple as that. And then after the accident, after I you know, gave up the um, Cloud Swing Act, Dolly and I had always wanted to work together. But she was a headliner and I was a headliner with the Cloud Swing Act. And so circuses never booked two headliners. They booked you know, a headliner. Uh, but the accident gave us the opportunity to create what we called On Wings of Love. It was an aerial pas de deux on the aerial straps. And I had seen a strap act on Cirque du Soleil uh, this uh, the Russian fellow was doing, and I, I thought it was just amazing. Uh, you had the sense of flight, and it was so smooth. And the idea was, what if we created a pas de And so we hired jo um, Guy Caron, who was the original artistic director for Cirque du Soleil. We brought in a choreographer, Jean Leger, who was the artistic director for the Winnipeg Royal Ballet, and we created this pas de um, and our first show was at Bush Gardens in, in, Sarasota, in Florida, Tampa, and we got an opportunity to go to Montreal. From Montreal, we got an opportunity to go to Japan, and from Japan, we went to Stuttgart. And during that time as working as a part of the, we soon realized uh, working together might not... I interrupted you, you're on... Because you kind of jumped ahead to I healed. Sure. Um, well, but there's got, I mean, it wasn't like one day your ankles were broken and the next day you were healed. No, actually, I had 18 screws and two plates in my left ankle, uh, which they removed. And then I had a subtalar joint fusion in my right ankle. Um, and Dolly got this offer to tour with Hammond. And the tour was going to be the um, anniversary of the seven man pyramid uh, accident in Detroit in the same building. And it was, you know, a, they were going to recreate the seminary pyramid at the, at the same place, at the same building. And so Jimmy Hammett offered uh, Dolly the tour. Uh, her sister and brother-in-law were invited with the elephants. And I said to Jimmy at that time, I said, Jimmy, would you like to book my cloud swing act? It'd been about a year after my accident. And he said, oh, I didn't know you were doing the cloud swing. Well, I wasn't. But I said, yeah, I'm doing it again. He said, sure, I will book your cloud swing act. So... I, uh, you know, committed myself to training again at Sailor Circus. And the reason why I did it was I just needed to, as they say, have closure. I had fallen because of a, mis a malfunction, not a mal mal set rigging. And I hadn't missed the rope. I hadn't made a mistake. And there's a thing in you that makes you want to do it again. So I practiced at Sailor Circus with my subtailor joint fusion. Um, took me a few weeks, and I was doing the jump again. Went on the road, did a, a tour, and after that tour, honestly, I, it was like, you know what, I'm done. I was very satisfied to roll up the cloud swing, put it in a bag, and say, I have closure. So how long was it between the fall, the accident, and, and when you did it again? About a year, I'd say at least a year. And Dolly can correct me on that, but it might have been a little bit longer, but definitely a year, at least a year. And he trained in the same... Sailor Circus. Sail where you are now. Yeah, Sailor wow. Circus. Yeah. You know, you say there's something in you. <clears throat> there's not, there's, that's not in me. I mean, um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, I'm sitting here, and I always think, you know, uh, my life, maybe others of you feel this way, you know, like the scariest thing I had to decide was like what to put on my resume and what to leave off. Um, you know, but uh, recreating this, the, the pyramid, recreating this act, um, you know, in one case people, lives were lost, in the other case your, your legs were, were crushed, I mean, but you just got to do it again, huh? Yeah, I think, um, you know, sometimes they say the bug gets you, well, the bug got me. And once the bug gets you, you bug. Yeah. Simple as that. And then after the accident, after I you know, gave up the um, Cloud Swing Act, Dolly and I had always wanted to work together. But she was a headliner and I was a headliner with the Cloud Swing Act. And so circuses never booked two headliners. They booked you know, a headliner. Uh, but the accident gave us the opportunity to create what we called On Wings of Love. It was an aerial pas de deux on the aerial straps. And I had seen a strap act on Cirque du Soleil, uh, this uh, the Russian fellow was doing, and I, I thought it was just amazing. Uh, you had the sense of flight, and it was so smooth. And the idea was, what if we created a pas de deux? 
And so we hired jo um, Guy Caron, who was the original artistic director for Cirque du Soleil. We brought in a choreographer, Jean Leger, who was the artistic director for the Winnipeg Royal Ballet. And we created this part at Deux. Um, and our first show was at Bush Gardens in, in, Sarasota, in Florida, Tampa. And we got an opportunity to go to Montreal. From Montreal, we got an opportunity to go to Japan. And from Japan, we went to Stuttgart. And during that time as working as a part of the, we soon realized uh, working together might not, might not be such a good idea. <laughs> you know? Because I was always right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Dolly would say she was always right. But at that time, it had always been a dream to start a professional circus school. And we went down that road and eventually started the National Circus School of Performing Arts. Here in town? In Sarasota. And we what year was that? Uh, September 30th, 1997, we incorporated as a non-for-profit organization. So you're coming up on 20 years. 20 years. We are in now 20 years. Wow. So you started the National Circus School. Um, with, I, I got to, you know, I want to, I'm making a movie of this in my head, um, but it all started back in South Africa with starting that school. I mean, teaching also seems to be very much a part of, of what circus, am, am I right or wrong? It seems like circus people want to share, want to teach. Is well, that true? Absolutely. I think uh, uh, circus arts is categorized as folk art. Folk art definition is passing or handing down one's art form to the next generation. It doesn't necessarily mean your siblings, but the next generations to come. So that's how I started at the YMCA, which was an, basically a training program. Uh -huh. And so my dream was when I retired as a very successful and fabulously wealthy uh, <laughs> retired aerialist, I would start a professional circus school. And so, you know, like they say, one door closes, another door opens. The accident gave us an opportunity to work together, and it gave us an opportunity to actually start the circus school. The idea was to bring back the living circus through education in Sarasota. Right. And where, did, where were you headquartered at that time? Well, actually, we started right here at the museum. We started a launching board. Uh, we met here at the museum. And the director then uh, was David Ebbets, Dr. David Ebbets. And we, I, Deborah, with the help of Deborah Walk, who was on our board, launching board, convinced him that we wanted to bring the Circus Museum to life. So what we created was mini shows and mini training sessions in the backyard, which is known as the Wagon Room, and that was in 1998. So the, a patron would buy a ticket to the museum, walk through the Wagon Room, and see Dolly Jacobs flying through the air, Dolly Jacobs landing, and saying, hi, welcome to the Circus Museum. <laughs> And it was a great interaction, and we did that for two years. We actually did some shows in the wagon room as well. Um, and then the museum went under, under construction, and things went on hold. Right. Yeah, because when I came here, I, th I think we did, you had brought it back for one or maybe two years. Two in, years. In the, in the backyard. Correct. We were upstairs remembering this, actually, and, um, and uh, having a good laugh over some of our colleagues who were very concerned about what Jasper the Wonder Horse <laughs> might do in, in, in the circus museum. And, um, and it was like, well, what, what will we do if he storms the crowd? And uh, Pedro and I just agreed what we would have done is charged more for those seats. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other, the other question was, well, what damage might um, pa oh, not Pedro the Wonder Horse, good Lord, <laughs> Jasper the Wonder Horse do to the wagons? And I said, I think it was Jasper's ancestors that pulled those wagons. But we eventually, we, Jasper performed. Jasper performed, Jasper, Jasper stayed until the end of the run of the shows. But then we found out about this used circus tent that was for sale up in Orlando. Uh, Dolly and I decided we wanted to buy this circus tent, used circus tent, and make the idea, the vision, the dream a reality. reality. So we borrowed $115,000 from the then Sarasota Bank. Uh, Sid Adler helped us uh, with yep. the purchase of everything. We bought the tent, and the very place we set it up for the very first time is out on Cattleman and uh, Fruitful Road, where today is now Sam's. 
<laughs> that was our first uh, circus tent uh, set up. And of course, you know the saying, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> so we thought. <laughs> so yes, I say to the people, I went to the school of very hard knocks. Um, you know those guys standing on the side of the street spinning the signs? Mm -hmm. I started all that. That was your idea? <laughs> <laughs> I remember December buying a Santa Claus outfit, climbing to the top of the tent with a sign and saying, circus is in town, circus is in town. So we did a lot of adventurous and wacky things trying to get the audience into the seats. There was over, there was 1,600 seats. We used to have about 150, 200 at the most. We did weekend performances, Friday, Saturday, Sundays. We did it for quite a few months, um, closed it down, and luckily for us, the Van Wezel was going under construction, the Van Wezel Performing Arts Hall, and the very next year they rented our tent, and we set it up the next year on their parking lot so they could present their performances throughout the season, the winter season. And we got to perform in the big top at the Van Wezel space, which was, it was very interesting. The, um, and the next, the following year, which would have been 2000, 2001, we were at the property at the fairgrounds next to Tuttle, next to Girls Inc. Okay. The loan we took out for the tent was a three-year balloon. Unbeknownst to us, the bank was being sold. Three years later, they called the loan. We didn't have any money to uh, pay back the loan, so we sold the tent to Tita Guyona, who's a fellow circus artist, trapeze artist, and uh, for the next three or four years, five years actually, we rented tents. And that's how our continuation from uh, the National Circus School of Performing Arts, and to jump back a little bit, we changed that name. We went from the National Circus School of Performing Arts to Circus Sarasota. The reason being, we realized very soon we had the cart before the horse, and that as a non-for-profit circus school, Economics didn't make sense. We didn't know how to raise money. We didn't know much about non-for-profit. We didn't know about foundations, grants. And honestly, it was, a, it was a struggle convincing our foundations, local foundations, that we were an art form, we are an art form, and we can give back to the community through the circus arts. Talk about some of the other programs besides the performance program. Sure. So 16 years ago, we started a program it's a human therapy program, and we called it Laughter Unlimited. It started at the Pines of Sarasota Nursing Home Assisted Living Facility 16 years ago, and we never, ever stopped going to the Pines of Sarasota. Every single week throughout the year, every single year, 16 years, we've been to the Pines of Sarasota twice a week. We've been, I, I forget the number, over 1,000 nursing homes, assisted living facilities we visited throughout Sarasota, Charlotte, and Manatee County. We collaborated with Meals and Wheels and many, many other non-for-profit organizations. And it's not about entertainment in a nursing home or assisted living facility or senior friendship center. It's about friendship, long-term relationships. Our clowns and entertainers become lifelong friends for the residents and patients and staff members. And it's incredible to see the bond of our artists with the, res with the residents and, and, and staff. The other program we had that we started here at the Ringley Museum is our in-school education program, which is curriculum based, based on uh, uh, the, the standards, the Florida standards uh, um, curriculum, and working with the educators, developing the curriculum, and using the circus arts to literally teach physics. It's amazing, it really is amazing. Um, and then other, um, I think, collaborations. I mean, we, we've worked together for years. Um, you do the program now with Key Corral every year. Well, let's talk about the Ringley Museum. With David Ebbets, we started the relationship, and it's been 19 years that we've been collaborating with the John and Mabel Ringley Museum of Art. And you got married here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's been, you know, I realized when we started right away from the get-go, we needed to collaborate with the museum. The museum represented the past, the history of what the circus is in Sarasota and nationwide. And we were the living circus and the future of the circus arts in Sarasota and beyond. 
And you know, working in the back, the wagon room, and performing, doing the demonstrations. And then 10 years ago, Dwight invited us back as Circus Sarasota to collaborate. And so we've been performing in this historic Oslo theater on the stage for the past 10 years. 10 years. And built it up from a two week program to a seven week program. And we are very proud as collaborators and partners to say we used to sell or we sold out the shows. So, it's, you know, thank you for that. 18, 19,000 people every summer right. um, in this space, 250 at a time. And it was That's about, a lot of shows. Yeah, and it was about, you know, again, the living circus in Sarasota at affordable prices. And it was about family. Grandparents, parents, grandchildren, children, seeing a show together, lifelong, wonderful memories. So what's, what's, what's riskier, what's scarier, the first time you take off the harness and jump through the <laughs> rope without a net, or keeping a circus alive? Well, you know, uh, our organization now in its 20th year, we put our big top up now at the UTC Mall. It's a fantastic location. We have beautiful seats. We bring in acts from all over the world. Our season normally runs in the month of February. I'm happy to say with this, in 2017, we're extending it another week. Instead of a three weekend run, we're doing a four weekend run. Wow. We've had incredible acts. Some acts debuting, obviously, for the very first time in America, in Sarasota. And for Dolly to be able to perform in a hometown, in a beautiful setting, you know. And again, I use the word art. It's the art of circus being demonstrated by incredible artists. And in a one ring intimate setting with beautiful lighting, beautiful atmosphere, and the artists then leaving again back to Europe, going back to South America, North America, and saying, wow, we performed on one of the most incredible circuses in Sarasota. And I'm happy to say the circus in Sarasota is alive and well. Yes, it is. You recently, I believe at one of your galas, went back up, went up in the air again, right? <laughs> yes, I did. Tell us about that. Well, you know, looking for something new and different to do at our gala, I thought it might, two years ago, I thought, you know, what if I went up on the high wire with Nick Wallander, we did a little pyramid, and we walked over the tables in a tent, and people could bid on it, and we could make <laughs> money for the gala. <laughs> it's all about the bottom line. So... I made that decision. I hadn't been on the high wire for about 20 years. I went over to Nick's house. He had the high wire set up about 15 feet off the ground. And him and I and Blake Wallander, I went on, I picked up the pole, went across the wire a couple of times and said, let's do this. And I got on the, uh, the pole, the shoulder pole, harness, and my right foot started to jump. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, I had to call Professor Psychologist Pedro Reyes in and say, talk yourself through this, you can do this, it's just a highway, you've done it before many times, just like a bicycle, and we did it, we went across. Came gala time, and uh, it was time for me to go on a highway, and it was not 15 feet now, it was like 30 feet in the air. And so we did it, I just got up there, did what I needed to do, and... Uh, said what an idiot I was to myself, you know. <laughs> but I'm yet to say we made the day. It was great. That's fabulous. And um, because the program is, is about people coming to this country, uh, you became a citizen when? I believe that was 2003, really? February 2003. And it was one of the proudest moments of my life was to become a United States citizen. That's fabulous. Um, I don't want this conversation to end just because I love the stories, <laughs> um, but we, are, we have um, run out of time. There's just one last thing that I, I want the audience to know about and maybe you can share a little bit. Uh, Pedro is working uh, this summer, this coming year, with the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. Uh, do you want to tell us a little about uh, sure. those plans? We're actually honored and we feel honored to be having been invited along with other organizations and circus schools to partner with the Smithsonian for a program that will be on the National Mall called Circus Arts. Our big top will be up on the mall, hopefully, if the National Parks and Services gives us a green light. I will tell you we have a light green light, waiting for the dark green light. 
Uh, things are looking very good. Uh, we're busy uh, fun, uh, fundraising to support the programs. Sailor Circus will be up there as, along with other circus schools. And what a great honor it is to take you know, a discipline, an art form that is so embellished here in Sarasota, started by the John and Ringling family in 1927, now continued today here with the Circus Arts Conservatory, the John and Mabel Ringling Museum of Art, and to represent that on the mall to literally millions of people from all walks of life. It's about me as a foreigner, an immigrant coming to America, becoming a U.S. citizen, bringing our art form, influencing an American uh, circus life. You know, I mean, hundreds of other nationalities came to America. I can think of Bulgarians, Cubans, French, British, German, Swiss, and we can go on and on. Russian, Czechoslovakian, Hungary, mm -hmm. keep going on and on and on. Literally, you know, immigrants from around the world. And that's what America is. And it's most, yeah, it's... Um it's a great story, and it's a, it's a great life you've lived, and thank you for sharing it. Um, that's all we do have time for today. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks to visit with Jeanette Williams. I'm looking forward to that conversation. Uh, but for now, uh, you can join us out front for a reception. Um, but before we go, join me in thanking Pedro for sharing it. Uh, you thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity.